want to thank you so much for joining us at the Principal's Coffee here at Coleman Hill. Uh, we have our special guest today, uh, Dr. Kaltenecker. Hi. And, Hello. Thank um, you. He's our uh, assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction. We also have Mrs. Letizia, our assistant principal here, and we're very fortunate we have Bobcat TV filming us. So thank you, Ms. Trainer. And if anyone is unable uh, to attend today, we will certainly have this on our website and um, you can view it for a second time or view it for the first time in the comfort of your home. So thank you, Dr. Kaltenecker, for coming to speak to us today. I do. I have, and if you'd like, I can do that for you. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for letting me crash the party for a moment. And uh, we'll have two parts to the presentation, which should be about 10 or 15 minutes. One is going to be something that I have to do. Um, and then the second one is, since I have you here, we'll talk about district initiatives. Um, as, before I talk about the district initiatives, um, let me get a sense of if you have children in the upper grade. So does anyone have Wampus children? Anyone have middle school children? A middle school, okay. How about high school? Yeah, no high school. Okay, so you'll hear a little bit about some things we're doing at the middle and high school. And it'll give you sort of a big picture vision of the district initiatives for the next few years. So what I need to start with is, <laughs> thank you. Um, here we go. And so I have to do this in terms of what's called Title I funding, and I'll explain what that is. So I'm click again. And so Title I funding is uh, we apply for money through a federal grant to receive some funds to support students who are struggling with um, gaining the student, uh, the, the learning standards in New York State. Um, so I apply for the funds every summer. We don't get a lot of money in Byram Hills, but it's because it's needs-based. So, you know, some districts get millions of dollars, some get a few hundred thousand. So on the next slide, we get $48,000 from Title I. There's also a second federal grant called Title II where we get about another $50,000. So while it's not a lot of money, I'll take anything we can get uh, from the federal government because then it's less money that we would have to tax uh, the community on and we can still provide rich support for our students who need that. So some of the things I've supported in the past include providing after-school academic support at our middle school. So what we do is we base that on students' performance on the state tests. So if students are performing below proficiency, we invite them to participate in academic support. Uh, we do some things during school, but we think the more support we can give students, the better. And since we have some funding for this, we can uh, pay teachers to give that support after school. And we also do it in the summer school through a summer school program. The goal is to catch kids up so that they have the foundation going into the next year. Other things I use funding for would be for professional development for teachers so we can enhance their skills and knowledge around supporting students who aren't meeting standards and also some materials or other types of items that we would need in terms of supplies or books or other resources to support students. And also part of the requirement that I have to present to you is how parents can be involved in our schools. Um, since you're here, that's most of the battle there. You know how to be involved and that's great. So our PTSA is an excellent way to be involved, getting involved, and I know Jamie's involved in our PTSA, so you can talk to her if you don't know much about it. Um, there's the Education Foundation, there's Bobcat TV, which is taping us now, and we always are looking for great volunteers, and it's a fun group to go around. What's great about being part of Bobcat TV is you visit all the buildings and you get to see these amazing programs, and it's one way to really learn a lot about the school by volunteering for Bobcat TV. And then there's some other committees you can be involved with as well. So that's the required part of my presentation. And the sign-in sheet is so I have evidence in case I get audited to show that I had this meeting. Because I'm required, since I received the federal funding, to show that I have uh, spoken to the community about what Title I is about. I do this at every principal's coffee. And that came up at a recent audit a few years ago that I wasn't doing that. So that's why I have to make sure I do it now. Um, so first, any questions on Title I funding? And then I'll talk about district initiatives, which is a little more exciting. Can I just yeah. ask one question about the state exams? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Do people opt out up here? Um, so, <laughs> that kind of wasn't an option. 
option, but if you're if you need to show it for funding, do you right. make it mandatory or you can't opt in? No, out? we can't make testing mandatory. My opinion is that's a family decision. Uh, we hope that parents will test their children because we de-emphasize the tests. It's not used to judge kids in any other way except to give us a benchmark for if students are attaining the standards or not. The tests in grades three through eight are low stakes. And by low stakes, that means it doesn't really count toward anything. What it does is give us information so we can make sure we're targeting any gaps in knowledge so students are ready for the high school program. Do parents opt out? We do have some numbers of opting out. I think we had, in, it varies from grade to grade between three and eighth grade. It gets higher as kids get to eighth grade because there's a little peer pressure uh, for kids to opt out uh, based on friends. But we have gotten the numbers lower, so it's between 5 and 10 percent, depending on the grade level. Any other questions on Title I? It's not linked to Title I, though. Oh, yeah. it's not. No, no. So there's no link there. Yeah. There's been threats of it, but the, the federal government or the state has never taken away funds for not meeting our participation rate. We're required to have 95 percent of our students take the state tests, or else it becomes reported in our New York State report card but we haven't been penalized. So if there aren't any other questions on Title I, let's go to the fun stuff, which is our district initiative. So first I want to show our mission statement. So we always go back to make sure everything we do aligns with our district mission. And I'll point out the highlights of this. Mutual respect is part of our mission statement. Um, community is part of our mission statement. We mean that broadly, including parents and others in the community, the local community. We want students to have the means, the knowledge, and the opportunity to excel so that they're productive and responsible citizens. Those are the key areas that drive everything we do in Byron Hills. This question has come up for many years, and we're really putting it out there to talk about in the last few years, is how do we balance having a rigorous academic program so that our students learn the best they can learn, find their passions in life, and get into the best colleges and are ready to succeed at the college level? with the emotional and social wellness of students. Because if we're stressing kids out and they can't function well, then we don't believe that they can attain those rigorous standards. We think that needs to be a balance. And I do believe we can do both. I think we can have high standards and make sure kids are emotionally well. And we'll talk about how we do that. There's a lot on this slide. I won't get into details about it, but I want to give you an overview because this sort of is a big framework. It all ties together. But I tried to tease out our initiatives into different areas of focus to give you a sense of how it relates to the district mission. And I'll give some examples of what we're doing in the district that hit these things. So one thing is about student empowerment. <clears throat> I think empowerment directly hits emotional wellness. Students feel somewhat that they have some authority and agency in their education. They own it. They are a little less stressed. They always feel the adults are telling them everything to do. It puts a lot of stress and pressure on young adolescents. So we try to do things that tie into giving, giving students some ownership of their learning. That'll come out down here in problem-based and authentic learning. When kids are exploring real life problems, when they have to problem solve and work on teams, we feel that also ties into the empowerment piece. When they can make some decisions about what they're learning as they get into the secondary level, um, we feel that also ties into the student empowerment. Critical thinking is uh, the 21st century skills go into our, um, a lot of our district initiatives around technology integration is where this started, but then it plays into problem-based learning as well. When kids are learning deeply in the classroom, we want them to be critical thinkers about the content. We want them to work together. We want them to learn how to communicate their understanding of knowledge. We want them to be creative in how they approach problem solving, and we want them to understand their impact on the greater community. That's how those things tie together. Curricularly, we're always focused on the core content of reading and writing, of mathematics, sciences, and social studies. And in recent years, we started to look at integrated curriculum to make more meaning for kids. So kids don't see everything as being isolated, they see connections. How does social events and real life events tie into reading and writing and thinking deeply about content? Um, how do the sciences and math and technology fit together? So we have a really extensive STEAM curriculum, which your children here at Coleman Hill might be starting to explore, and you might have seen some of that. Um, 
as they get older, we have a very clear articulated STEAM curriculum going up through the upper grades. I'll show you a couple pictures to show that as well and talk about that in a moment. And in recent years, we've been talking about global competency, and I'll explain what we're doing at the high school on the next slide. We also focus on leadership. That's something in recent years we've been thinking about as part of our mission, is that when students graduate here, we want them to have the skills of a leader. Um, so we came up with a framework that we've used from some research on these attributes, and we're now talking about how we help kids develop leadership skills using these five ideas. And then finally, character education has been in Byron Hills for at least 20 years. We developed these three principles through our site-based team. That is respectful dialogue, respect for self and others, and service and kindness. And that's now playing into our social emotional learning framework that I'm working with the principals. So we can create an articulated curriculum K-12 on how we're teaching social emotional learning with students. So a couple examples. We've developed a really strong robotics curriculum that starts, there's pockets of it here and there's pockets of it at Wampus, but we have a six through 12 curriculum on STEAM. So students start learning uh, coding. Um, they learn it as early as second grade here or even first, younger, first grade. And then we start programming robots. Kids start designing robots to meet challenges when they're in the middle school. This is a high school robotics camp which to put a little plug in for that, we have a February camp, so if children in the middle and high school, uh, what are we doing, fifth through ninth grade students can sign up for a robotics camp in February, and again in the summer, we tried it last summer. But we have a really intensive robotics course, three-year three, three -year sequence of courses at the high school in, on robotics and engineering, and we're developing some more STEAM courses at the high school level. Uh, we've also talked, started a global competence program so basically global competence is about teaching kids about world events and how to think about world events and problem solve and how can they start getting involved in areas that better the whether it's a local or global community so we've been partnering with a couple agencies uh, to help us develop this and we've created a three-year sequence at the high school called our global scholars program so starting in tenth grade kids can take courses that start teaching them how to think about world events how to look at things from different perspective and how to solve world problems. We're in year two of that, so we're still building the program. Um, and so far it's going really well. We are now in the process in January, we start having kids sign up for their courses for next year at the high school level. That's how early we start planning. And we so far have 74 students requesting to take the year one program next year. That's how successful the program is. Um, and it's fairly a new program. So you'll hear a little bit more of that as your kids get older, and we'll talk more about global competence, and we're still developing what that might look like across all buildings. And finally, let me just talk about some of the partnerships. Um, we just don't make this stuff up all the time. We try to work with high-power organizations that are doing really innovative work uh, to make sure our programs are research-based and fit with universities. So we've had a long-term partnership with the University of Michigan. Um, starting with the Depression Center at the high school where we're trying to work on a wellness for high school students. We've also extended that partnership last year with the Department of Education at the University of Michigan. We also are partnering with Stanford University. Um, you might have seen some information from the district about challenge success. That's something we're looking at at the middle school and high school. There was a big survey last year which gave us some information about our students. Um, the founder of Challenge Success out of Stanford University, Denise Pope, is speaking on February 4th, and she's talking about the college process um, and also about wellness of students. And we've been partnering with Yale University, NYU. Um, those are some high-power organizations that are helping us think about uh, curriculum and instruction. We also are partnering with Global Competency with the Asia Society and World Savvy who are helping us design the, the work that we're doing in the district. And that's how we think we're trying to tie our initiatives together to the mission and hopefully creating the leaders of the next generation. We thank Dr. Later. Kaltenecker for, thank you. for the presentation and it yeah. perfectly aligns to um, exactly what uh, we'll be discussing today because as Dr. Kaltenecker uh, said, creating the leaders of the next generation, I'd like to share with you specifically what we're doing at Coleman Hill. As Dr. Kaltenecker mentioned previously, how do we create the leaders of the next generation here at Coleman Hill? Well, we're providing our students with the enrichment 
opportunities while nurturing their social and emotional health. So I'd like to explain in more detail what we're doing for those enrichment opportunities as well as um, social and emotional health. So our enrichment opportunities, they're really centered a lot around problem-based learning. Um, and a lot of this is done um, through the integration of our Technology Library Center, which was a very generous gift um, from our Byron Hills Education Foundation. So for example, in grade two, they're creating um, something that's called school tree houses. I'll go into that in a bit more detail. Um, but once again, they are planning, they're doing some engineering, creativity, communication, as well as collaboration. Um, in a moment, um, we will try doing some coding using our B-Bots, which I have over there, and we'll experience that. Kindergarten, they will be creating pinwheels. They have to design them, they have to test them, and revise them to see how well they're working. And lastly, K-2, um, digital footprints in regard to internet safety. Um, you'll see as you walk around the footprints all around the walls, and that is to show that wherever you go online, your digital footprint is always there. So we need to be very safe about the sites that we visit. We have specific lessons geared toward this, and children get badges that they put on their footprints um, as they complete these lessons. So any, any questions before I move forward on that? All right, wonderful. So um, a little insight, what second grade uh, has been working on, they were presented a problem, and the problem was you're living in a swamp. Oh my goodness and there's lots of alligators all over and you need to design a school the grounds too wet and so therefore you need to build a school in the trees they had to work in small groups to design the school and they had to think about all the important aspects within a school they needed to think about the structure what is my school going to look like? They needed to plan it. Think about the safety and the stability and all these aspects that are involved within um, architecture. So here's an example of one of the um, tree schools that, were, that was designed by a group of second grade students and they needed to present this um, to uh, their classmates. Um, so describe your school. This school had a bunch of zip lines. That's how they were going to get back and forth. Um, they also wanted to have apple trees so as kids got hungry, they could <laughs> eat the apples. Um, and to be safe in case someone fell off the zip line, they had safety nets. And the safety nets also would prevent, see these hungry alligators? Um, it says water um, and they're chomping. Um, it would protect them from the alligators. Uh, what makes your school stable and safe? There are support beams and a bridge to keep it stable and safe from alligators. And what makes your school special? We have four zip lines, we have a net for safety, we have 10 crocodiles, and we also have apple trees for the kids. I was fortunate enough to be able to see this in action. And so they did need to work in small groups. And to me, this really mirrored real life, um, like as if you were working or if you were in college. Um, they had to agree before they put things on paper. And there were many disagreements, and they needed to learn how to disagree respectfully, how to negotiate, um, and how to present their idea um, in a say, convincing and respectful way. Um, you know, at one point, I remember one group was um, having a disagreement. One girl was saying, you know, we need to have a really large library in our school because we need to read about alligators and how to keep us safe and maybe learn like what we should be feeding them so they don't come up. Um, but the, the other student really wanted to have um, 
a, a, a large gym with bouncy houses and all these. <laughs> and so they had to negotiate um, what part would be the library and what part would be the gym and the importance of each. And they were both really giving some very critical arguments. Like it's really important to have a gym because you need, um, you need exercise, this helps you, it helps you think. And the young lady was saying, well, we also need books and how important it is um, to learn that way. So they really learned um, some real life um, skills through this project. Uh, so before I go um, into the social and emotional health, actually, I would like to share with you um, another aspect. I had mentioned the, um, the coding, excuse me for a moment, let me just go back, sorry, um, that we were doing. And we're also doing coding um, in first grade. And we do that through the use of something that's called B-Bots. Um, and I'd like to give you all an opportunity to try some of that. So we try to very much integrate um, what we're doing in the classroom in the TLC. So something first grade is studying as they're studying um, directionality or coordinates north, south, east, west. Um, and so Mrs. Singh, Mrs. Devilar, they have made game boards with all different places around Armonk. We have the town center pharmacy, we have Beehive restaurant, the gas station, Taza, um, Citibank, everything um, within the Armonk community is, is on our, our game pad. And what students are given oh, sorry, sorry. is um, we have is a B-Bot, and our B-Bots are introductions to, to coding. So if my sheet said, I need to go three spaces east, then one space north, and then I have to write where I am within the um, Armand community, and I have my compass rose right here, to guide me. So if I were to do this, it might look like this. First, I need to get my, if I have to go three spaces east, I need to turn my b -bot. So I'm going to press this once, and then I need to go three spaces east. So that would be one, two, three. <laughs> they do this in all the classes, or is this first grade? Yep. And when? so I have the when they're in the, um, not yet, they are going to be doing it very soon. Um, I heard about it. <laughs> right? And so um, now I'm at the Beehive restaurant, perfect place where I love to be. Um, but these are the activities um, that we have our students doing, and they're doing this in small groups. This is, like I said, the introduction to coding, but also it's done in group work. So they have to agree how, like, what what we're going to be pressing in order to um, to program the the B bot. Um, these are the activities, um, the problem based learning that our students are engaging in uh, to help create those leaders of the next generation. So let me explain to you about what we're doing here at Coleman Hill um, for social and emotional health. Um, very soon in February, we are going to have um, a guest speaker. His name is Robert Rivest, and he is an international uh, performer as well as teacher who's really traveled all over the globe to give presentations about emotional wellness. Um, so a little bit about our upcoming assembly. This will be February 6th. It's called healthy choices. And here, Robert is going to be discussing what it means to have healthy choices for food, for entertainment, mindful eating he's going to be talking about, um, as well as safety and how we can make these choices every day. In August, um, Scott Levy had said to the teachers when he was addressing the teachers, you do so much to make uh, our students emotionally healthy. 
um, I hope you are also taking care of yourselves too. And so we are going to be giving a stress relief workshop um, for our Coleman Hill teachers and staff. That will be March 7th for the teachers and the 14th for the aides on that half day. And uh, the idea here is to walk away with stress relief tips uh, that we can employ at any time. Um, also, something we'll be doing is March 25th through the 29th, Robert will be here doing individual classroom sessions. And here he's going to talk about how to navigate our own emotions. So um, how do we communicate our feelings appropriately to maybe to adults or to our peers? Um, how to resolve conflict? as well as how to reduce anxiety. And lastly, for our social and emotional wellness is our wonderful gift um, for our educational play space. We received this from the BHEF. This um, has, has been amazing for us. Um, our play space is an opportunity for our students really to have movement breaks, to have brain breaks, um, it builds their problem-solving skills, a lot of language development, whether they're going through the hover rings or over or under our car wash um, rings. Um, it, it's just a wealth of opportunity. And then also, um, we recently had some visitors from Terrytown, some educators visit us, and um, they actually went in the play space and they came out and they were laughing and had smiles on their face and said, see, see how this reduces your stress too. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we, we'd like to thank our BHEF once again for providing this opportunity for us. And all of these things that you were looking at today, the bee bots, the um, trees, uh, the school tree houses, um, these are all gifts um, from our wonderful BHEF. And so we thank the BHEF for the generosity. We hope you have a great day. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.